And so, like, yeah. And so leading up to camp, I was able to just pray for them. I prayed that all the distractions would go away, that God would take the burdens off of their shoulders, that the time would just remind them of God's love, that they could have peace through each of their situations. And I prayed that they would build relationships with other believers that were facing the same adversity as them. And oh boy, can I tell you, God does not disappoint. God answered every single one of my prayers on the first night. <laughs> so God's never late. Um, it was after the lesson on the first night during Snack Shack. And we had, I guess what you could call like a family swing where basically all of the cousins and all of our friends just came running eager to share the love of Jesus. They were already finding ways to apply that night's lesson to their everyday lives. And this excitement was carried into the next day. Each day they went to bed more and more eager to see what God had in store for them tomorrow, to see in what ways they would grow tomorrow. And um, so each day brought more and more excitement and just growth for all of us. And um, as the week carried on, we had finally reached last night. Josh had given us an altar call. With this call, I was able to take every single one of my cousins up individually and just pray for them because I just wanted to praise Jesus for all that he had, all he had done in their lives, for all of the growth that had happened. I just wanted to pray that as they got back into the world that that fire for him would not go away, that through all of the worldly temptations, all of the distractions, through it all, they could just stand. As we left camp the next morning, we were changed. Um, and just to see the growth in all of them is truly amazing. I mean, all of the glory to God. Um, they went from trying to skip services, finding reasons to leave early, making excuses not to come, to actively being involved in both services, taking notes, answering questions. And I just could not have been more blessed to witness this all firsthand because prayer is powerful. I'm Ezra Lewis, and I'm 13 years old. Um, it all started when I was seven years old. Um, a night at church on Wednesday night, uh, they were talking about being saved and uh, what it meant to have God in your heart. That night, uh, on the ride home, I told my parents that I wanted to get saved. So we got Pastor, one of Pastor Bobby's tracks, and uh, we read it, we read the Bible, and then we prayed, and I got saved. And then at camp, Matt told me uh, there was a kid who was sitting alone by himself, and he told me uh, if I told him to sit with us, if I asked him to sit with us, that um, he would tell me who my cabin was. And um, after camp, uh, the boy's mom texted my dad about what happened and uh, made a whole conversation about my dad telling me that uh, in my eighth grade year, I need to be more of a leader and uh, in the youth, we have amazing leaders like Matt, Eddie, Michelle, Jen, and Andrew. But he meant a leader as a kid in the youth to be a prime example of God working with me. Is I'm blessed with the family who loves me, and I've been in church my whole life. I'm, I know not many people get that, but it's just a way that I can show how God can work through me and how God can work through other people that don't have that. Thank you. My name is Liz O'Neill. Um, this year at camp was just so amazing seeing everyone become so much closer to God and with each other. Um, and that kind of just explained the last night of camp with keeping the unity. We were all crying there. We were all crying and we were all there for each other. Um, that was just something that was just so amazing to me. But also that night I went to Michelle to talk to her about something that was on my heart. What was on my heart that night was one of my friends was going down the wrong path. And because I cared about her, I told her many times she needed to stop what she was doing. 
and she got mad at me, <laughs> which was not bad, I guess. Um, but I told Michelle I didn't know how I was supposed to help her because if she wouldn't let me tell her she was doing wrong, I didn't know how I was supposed to fix her. And that was what I had to realize, is that I couldn't fix her. It was God's work, not mine. And all I could do was pray and hope that he would help her. And about two weeks after camp, um, she texted me and told me she had stopped what she was doing. And that's just what was so amazing, is because God answered my prayers. God helped her. And it just, I had, again, I had to realize it was God's work, it wasn't mine, and that I tried to always fix things and take into my own hands, which was wrong, and that was what I took out of camp. got like maybe two minutes so kids this is the shortest you'll ever hear me speak uh, uh, hi I'm Matt for those of you that don't know me um, I was all geared up for camp and ready for what God had in store for us the first full day was challenging to say the least but when God's up to something we know we must stand in the battle so looking back at it now I realized that I needed to be in humility and take up the cross, as Luke 9.23 says. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily and follow me. So I know God is always in control, and I let frustration seep in. Um, and uh, I lost my spot. And lost sight of him for a minute. Something God has really brought to my attention is disciples walked with him constantly, but they struggled all the time when they lose sight of him. So that's just the same as us, right? Um, but yet he constantly uses us despite of us. Um, God is faithful and just. We just need to trust in him and trust in his doing. Despite my little frustration, God still got the glory. God had a plan, and I couldn't see it, but he did it and used me in a mighty way. God has been reminding me uh, of one of my verses, Philippians 2.14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. But I love what it said after that in the next two verses, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. God knows our hearts and desires. Uh, and he continues to bless us beyond I, what I deserve. Bless me beyond what I deserve. So once again, uh, he showed me to do less whining and complaining and stop trying and to start trusting, as a good friend has said to me just recently. And that, um, I know you guys get my emails or whatever for junior high, and I always say, fight the fight and shine the light, because this Christian walk is an easy thing, but we got to keep pursuing and fight through it and shine our light, as the verses say, and uh that song uh, that Toby Mac sings, uh, Promised Land, that's kind of where I was. You know, we're looking at where's my promised land, where's my promised land, we're looking here on the earth, and really we need to look at his promised land. I love that the verse in there, it says, I won't give up on this race, broken, but I still have faith. That this whole life is all part of a plan, and I can feel it in my soul. One day I'll stand before the throne with nothing left but hope in these two hands. Thank you.
Hello everyone, I'm Nazir Castilleja, and how yeah, much time I got? All right, so camp, it was crazy. I'm not gonna lie. I walked into camp all excited because my cousins were going, and my cousins are like my best friends because I knew them all my life. And it's crazy how I got the same cabin members for the past four years, so we we're all kind of close. But the crazy thing is everyone, from the beginning, we didn't really know each other. We were just like, hi, how you doing, you know? Just kind of like talking. But at the end, everyone was so close together. And it kind of proves that like, well, God, everyone can come together and be all happy and enjoy each other. Like, the very first day I wasn't feeling, I was like, oh, it's a long ride. I don't want to be here no more. Like, you know, see ya. But at the end, I noticed how everyone on day three, everyone was like, no, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home. And I asked my cousin why he didn't want to go home, because he was the biggest one. He was like, I want to go home, Naz. I was like, okay. Like, cool. And so on day three, we had this amazing preacher named Jeff. He was talking about how we all need to come together and be a herd. And I really wanted my cousin to get saved for, like, my whole life. I've been talking to him all my life about getting saved, and I didn't know what to do. And one day, Josh pulled me out. It was, like, day two. He was like, Naz, you need to be a testimony, you need to be like more paying attention because that's how you're going to get him to follow. So if you follow God and believe by example, other people will follow. I was like, okay. He said, you're the missing key. Believe it or not, the next night, my cousin Angelo got saved. And... And it was amazing because like I never, like, cried before. Like, honestly, I never cried about someone getting saved. Like, it was my first time, like, actually caring for someone getting saved. I'm, like, that's just me, though. So it was, like, around, like, he said, everyone come up and pray. And I just talked to my cousin. I was like, hey, you want to go come pray? The next thing you know, Jeff comes along. He's like, hey, you guys want to talk? I was like, okay. We walked to the bench. And we all start talking. And I was like, he's like, you have anything to say, Angela? I was just like. No, not really. He said, okay, you want to start in prayer? I was like, no. So, um, so when I started talking, I started crying. I was like, wow, this really, like, touched me. And it really wanted me to, like, do that to more people. Like, I wanted that same feeling for other people. Like, I want him to lead to other people so he gets the same feeling as me. I want, like, let's say Josh. Like, he gets a feeling all the time, like, he leads people, and he makes other people lead other people. And it's kind of crazy because, like, that feeling is unbeatable because, like, God gives you that energy and strength to do that. And it gives you, like, more confidence, too. And just seeing everyone at, like, as a herd, like the whole camp was, like, be a herd and be close together is quite amazing. And that's what God taught me. It's just, like, you can't do nothing without God. And if you start walking away, stuff's going to get tough. So stay close to God. All right, see you. Naz, did you have any notes for that? <laughs> okay. I can't do that. <laughs> um, so, hello. Uh, my name is Ty Sanchez. Um, I've been in the high school side of the youth group for a little over four years now. I'm also a product of this youth group. Um, as well. And uh, unfortunately, I was only at camp for two days um, as my best friend was getting married that week. And uh, I was one of his groomsmen, which was fun. However, even though I was only at camp for two days, that does not mean that God can't talk to you. Um, one of the things that God showed me was that oftentimes as servant leaders at camp, at least for me, we can sometimes get so caught up in making sure everyone is where they are when they're supposed to be, that they have everything that they need, uh, that they put on sunscreen, bug spray, and, of course, take showers. Um, he gets so caught up with all that that I forgot that God is also trying to speak to me as well. Um, and this is something that he really convicted me about. And, yes, all those other things that I mentioned are very important, um, but that is the most important thing because in order to be steadfast, or 
theme. Um, in order to be steadfast, we must listen to God constantly. And the more that I pondered this thought, the more I realized, sorry, this might get a little preachy. The more that I pondered this thought, the more that I realized that it, this issue truly does not just apply to me as a servant leader at camp. This issue transcends age, education, and financial status. Students, how often do you get so wrapped up in your homework and extracurricular activities that you neglect to stop, take a breath, and realize that God is trying to speak to you in that moment? Adults, how often do we get so wrapped up in our work that we do the same thing? Maybe you're so focused on hitting your mark at work so that your quarterly or annual reviews shines above everyone else so that you can get that promotion. Maybe you're in between jobs right now, and that can be really rough, but you're so focused on trying to find a new job and get your life back on your track that you fail to stop and listen to the God of the universe say, hey, I derailed your train so that we could go this way, and trust me, it will be so much better for you and everyone else. Um, John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 say, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I believe God's challenge, not just to myself, but to everyone in this room and indeed this church, is to stop, take a breath, and listen. That's as good as it gets. Uh, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 1. As you're turning there, students, turn there so you don't get to look. Yeah, we're doing that. By the way, these lights are awesome, aren't they? Fun fact of the day, these are called Edison lights. I learned that from Mike Meyer. So. All right, so once you're there, students, can you say it by heart? Philippians 1.27. You guys all said it at camp. Okay, give it a shot. If, if you didn't go to camp, you can read it. You're allowed. All right, Philippians 1.27, say it with me. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Let's go. I saw you guys. Let's pray. God, we love you. Father, we just want to come to you this morning and tell you, God, we want you to have every ounce of glory God, you did things at camp that nobody in this room can do. And so you deserve that credit. You deserve that glory, Lord. And so we want to give it to you. We want to lift you up, um, your name high, where it belongs. Um, God, because you are, the, you are the greatest. You are the name above all names. You're the king above all kings. So we just want to proclaim that this morning and give you all the glory um, for what you did at camp in the, in the hearts of our young people and so evidently in the hearts of our leaders as well. God, we love you. Um, would you just be glorified here this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, man, those testimonies were fantastic. Nice fact. We got to give him one more hand. Nice job. <laughs> so, students, you guys know this verse pretty well. Like I said, I think every camper said it, which is pretty awesome. So, Philippians 127. So, I want to look at that real quick um, to kind of lay a framework. So, Philippians 127 kind of has three parts. The first one says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And if you're 30 years or younger, you probably haven't used the word becometh a whole lot other than when you're reading the Bible, okay? And you also don't use the word conversation like it's used in this verse either. So we gotta define those before we get going. So conversation, okay? It's a general course of manners or behavior, okay? So we're not just talking about your words or your speech, right? We're talking about your actions, your deeds, the things that you do as well. And becometh. Right, so in general, to be to suit or be suitable, um, another word that, that came up a lot was appropriate. So what this first part of the verse is telling us is that all of our actions are supposed to be suitable of the gospel. That is a big challenge. 
every single one of them. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And so if you think about it, students, I have bad news for you. You guys go back to school in like a month. Womp womp. It's coming up quick. Adults, you guys are still going to work unless you're a teacher. Then you got a little more time. But imagine this. Let's say somebody at your work or at your school that knows you pretty well, but let's say they don't know you're a Christian. What would be their response if they were to find out that you're a Christian? Would it be, oh, that makes sense. They're a good guy. I kind of, I thought I saw him praying the other day. Or would it be like, wait, that guy? See, because we're supposed to be suitable. It's supposed to make sense. The things that we, are, that we do are supposed to make sense in light of the power of the gospel. And so, man, to only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ is a pretty big statement. Now, the second part, this is the, uh, where our camp theme verse came from, or our camp theme was, was stand fast. And as it was really cool how this theme came together. So uh, the CISAs came over to our house one day, and we were kind of trying to plan for camp. And what I did is I asked them, will you guys describe just where the junior high is at at this point? And then Addie and I had the same homework. We just gave a brief synopsis of where is the high school class at right now. And so as Matt and Michelle were talking, they, they mentioned that the junior high class is learning to stand through trials. That when stuff goes wrong, when they get made fun of at school, whatever the case is, are they going to keep their integrity? Are they going to seek to still um, praise the Lord? Or are they kind of going to back into the bushes and hope that nobody really knows what they believe? Well, then when Addie and I explained where the high school was at, it was similar but different. It was that our high school class was learning to stand up for their faith. We had been doing evangelism skits. Um, we, we do this weekly challenge where we share any opportunities we've had to encourage somebody or love on somebody or share the gospel. And so we were learning how to do that. And so both classes, so the entire youth group as a whole was learning to stand just in different ways, right? One was standing through trials and one was standing for their faith. And then this third part, this one spirit and one mind was really cool because it really tied into our camp theme from last year. Our camp theme from last year was keep the unity. And so here we go. Now we're moving on to stand fast, but we need to be reminded that we need to keep the unity as well. And so we have three parts to this verse, right? And so I'd like to kind of use those um, to, to, help a, to help set a framework. So our, somebody mentioned our camp speaker's name was Jeff. Um, he mentioned three um, statements of fact that, that really helped set a, um, a, a good framework for the entire week. The first one was that your or that doctrine is important. Okay, I think we can all agree on that. Doctrine being teaching is very, very important. The second one is that our doctrine shapes our behavior. So what you believe shapes what you do. And then the third one was that our behaviors will build a testimony. So what we believe turns into what we do, and then what we do builds a testimony so that other people around us see. And we, we kind of saw this all throughout camp. It, it kind of echoed, at least in my mind, a lot. We were studying Daniel, uh, chapters 1 through 3. So we, we learned about um, Daniel, you know, um, not taking of the king's meat. Uh, we learned about um, Daniel um, being thrown in the lion's den, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And so, we, you know, this whole idea of building your testimony was, was really big. And so then one night, Jeff shared a really cool story. He was a young boy. I think he got saved sophomore year. I found out we went to a camp together. I think I was graduating, and he was um, going into his sophomore year, and that's actually the camp he got saved at, which is kind of cool to hear. But he was trying to, trying to follow the Lord as a young believer, and he had this friend who he would share the gospel with a lot. Well, one night they were hanging out, and he decided to, to share the gospel with this guy. And do you guys remember what his response was, the guy's response? Yeah, he got shot down real hard. The guy literally was like, Jeff, stop talking to me about God. I don't want to hear it anymore. And so their, their relationship was kind of splintered at that moment. And so, you know, after that, about, he said 10 years later, hadn't talked to the guy a whole lot. He got a message from that guy about, and he, he, I think it was over Facebook, and said, hey, Jeff, I apologize for going off on you so many years ago. I want you to let you know that I've accepted Christ and I'm now following him with my life. And so this guy who, that had to shook, to shook him when he, had, when he got shot down from trying to share the gospel, right? 
But now, 10 years later, we see the fruit of that. And so we see this concept matters. What you believe affects your behavior, and then your, your behaviors affect your testimony. And so I'd, I'd like to kind of use that framework to kind of share some highlights from our camp, because it was awesome. Um, so the first one, that doctrine being important, um, team building I thought was one of the coolest parts of camp. And so this picture up here was, was one of the activities that, that most of the kids did. It was a V cable, right? And so the, basically the objective was you were supposed to get with one other person, and there was this cable that would get farther and farther apart, right? Probably about eight foot high maybe? I don't know. Somewhere around there. All right. So you're supposed to make your way down. Well, clearly the first people that tried to make it eight foot across while only holding on to each other, they failed. Okay? They got a little bit farther, but then they ended up falling. Well, then um, Rich, who was leading our group, gave us, gave us a, a, a little bit of a um, help. He said, okay, now the people around you can catch you if you're about to fall. Well, now we were more successful, right? And then as we kept going, they said, okay, now you can actually hold them up. You can actually physically keep them together and, and walk them down. And so they did it. What seemed impossible with only two people was now possible because we were relying on the people around us. And so once again, this doctrine being important thing, right, the, 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 the fact that they couldn't do it alone, now we realize that, man, when I have believers around me, we can do this. And then the second one that was pretty cool was this balancing board. So this is, I think this is the entire junior high on that thing. Pretty awesome. And what we learned from this one was that when we're trying to balance this board, I, I saw it really specifically with the high school, it was really, really close to being balanced and then one person took a step back. And you know what happened, the whole board went splat, right? And th this kind of showed us that, wow, our actions affect other people. So if I'm trying to follow the Lord and I just can't do it anymore, I gotta take a break, I, I can't read the Bible anymore, I, just, I, I, gotta, go, I gotta go do something else, I, I, I'm gonna stop going to church for a while, I just need to you know, do me for a little bit, I hate that phrase. That affects other people. Somebody was excited to see you on that Sunday morning and you didn't make it and they're a little less excited. It affected their walk. And then the last one I think was probably my favorite was tug of war. So you guys saw the video um, of one of them. Now, so Brownie and Rich Cummings did our, our team building and I've never played tug of war like this. So the first time we went, I think we did one time where we just all pulled like normal tug of war, right? Well then, after that, Brownie was shaking it up and he said, okay, now only four people on each side get to, get to pull. But here's the thing, if you are struggling, if you're losing or you just need some help, you can call to all these other people who are just standing around doing nothing to come help you. Well, that was the video you guys saw and did you notice that even though the, they were losing, there were still people standing on the sideline doing nothing? Why? You, we told you, you could take whoever you want, you, whoever you need, just call them up and they can help you. But it's really interesting that there were people standing around doing nothing. And then the last one, which I thought was the most powerful, now he said, okay, if you're standing on the sideline, you don't have to wait to be called to come help. When you see a need, you can go fill it. And so then, literally, Emily was like pulling on one side, and then they started winning, so she jumped over to the other side and started pulling from that side. <laughs> I've never played tug of war like this. <laughs> but the spiritual principle that came from that was unbelievable. Because see, as believers, if our friend is struggling, most of the time we wait for them to reach out to us. Or we wait, we wait to say, eh, I don't, I don't want to bug them, I don't want to annoy them, they're going through stuff, I'll just leave them alone. But see, when we see a need in other people, what's stopping you from going and filling that need? What's stopping you from texting them and calling them and saying, hey, is there anything I can do for you? Can I just pray for you? Why won't we do this? Those were the rules of the game. Whatever help you need. Well, guess what? Those are the rules of this life as well. You don't have to do it by yourself and God doesn't intend you to either. He, he, you can have the help you need. All you gotta do is call for it. And as a believer, all you gotta do is see a need and go fill it. And so this awesome team building where we're le learning these deep principles, this deep doctrine, right, of, of, how, of what we should believe that would affect our behavior what, what kicked us off for a really cool camp. And then the second one, right, doctrine informs our behavior. Now, one of my favorite parts about camp is our skits. 
So we do, we, they get like three or four practices per week or, you know, for the whole week. And then they have to put on a skit um, for the last night. Or last, yeah, it was last night. And so my personal favorite skit was the Golden Monkeys, right? Golden Monkeys? Or, okay, there we go. Golden Monkey. Ezra's the only golden monkey we have. So their skit was about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the main character was Ray Ray, or as you may know him, Raymond Curtis, whatever. Um, He's not the tallest guy around. And he was in a cabin with three junior high kids that are all six foot. Well, the three junior high monsters were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Ray Ray was Nebuchadnezzar. And so if you remember that story, this, the, the skit started off with Ray Ray looking at all these monsters and yelling at them and saying, why won't you worship? Why won't you bow down? It was incredible. I lost it immediately. Because this, this was the, the Ray, Raymond was the only sixth grade boy that we had going to camp. And so he was able to stand up to these monsters and let it go and steal the show. Why? I learned something about Ray Ray. He believes in himself. He may not always show it, but he believes in himself because somebody that doesn't believe in themselves, they can't do that. And so what he believed informed his behavior. And my, one of my other favorite skits was from the Banana Nas. I say it right? Banana Nas. Okay. And theirs was really cool as well because... The day of the skit performance, they got into an argument. There was a split in the camp, and they were arguing about what their skit should be on the last practice. Well, instead of going to pool time that day, they decided we, we got we to gotta work this out with a little bit of help from their servant team. And so they skipped some of the pool time, went up to their room, and worked it out. Now, the really cool part about this story is on Monday we learned about Matthew 18 about how to resolve conflict. And so they all got an opportunity to learn doctrine. How does God say we should work out our differences? And then they got an opportunity to put it into place. They couldn't work it out together, so what did they do? They got a leader and they worked it out together. And the coolest part about this was they still couldn't figure out what their skit was, so you know what they did their skit on? Their argument. They literally got up there and argued with each other and then had a, the servant team came down and worked it out. And then finally at the end they told us, yeah, this was our skit. This actually happened to us today. How cool is this? We learn biblical principles and then we put them into practice. So cool. And then one of my, my by far my favorite night um, was Friday night. Now I have to confess a little bit that Come What May song that we sang, that one was going in my head the entire week. And so when we were singing, you know, I just kept having that in my head. Well, it reminded me of the fact that when I was praying for camp, I specifically remember telling God, you do what you want. I don't, I don't know what you want to do. I can ask. I can say, yeah, I want to see growth in this person or this person needs to, needs to know the Lord or whatnot, right? But I specifically just remember being like, God, I just want you to get glory. Whatever it is, I just want you to be lifted up. And so I got tested there because on Thursday... We didn't really have any highlights. There's a few here and there. But I'd been praying for camp and praying for camp and saying, God, do what you want to do. And then on Friday or on Thursday, going into Friday, there wasn't really a whole lot of fruit. And I started to realize that my prayer, I don't know if I really meant it. Because I told you, God, you can do whatever you want to do. But when it didn't match my expectations, I started to get nervous. I started to get frustrated. And then that song came in, come what may. And so it was an opportunity for me to say, Lord, I mean it this time. Whatever you want to do at this camp, you got it. Well, then on Friday night, I've been telling people the dam broke. You guys saw the picture. There was about 20 kids at the altar praying, and there was salvations, and we did the bonfire that night and heard testimonies, and all of a sudden, overwhelming. See, because God, Emily said it, God works on his timing. He does things when he is ready to do things. Because guess what? He knows what's going on in our hearts, and he knows when we're ready to receive what he has. And then the last one, behavior builds a testimony. And so uh, this was one of the most exciting things we got to plan for camp. So as many of you know, um, we were short a servant leader this year. Um, Don Pratt went to camp with us last year, and a month later, she left us. And so we decided we wanted to give an award um, for camp this year. 
Um, so this is it. It's, it's called the Where Your Treasure Is Award. And it's based on Matthew 6, 21. Because every email that, that um, Don sent um, to the staff at our church, at the bottom of it, it said Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so two people at camp won this award based off the life that Don lived. See, because when Don went to camp, it didn't matter what she wanted. It didn't matter what she needed. She was there to serve other people. She slept with a CPAP machine, and yet she somehow went to camp because she didn't care about herself. She's there because she wants to introduce people to Jesus and love on them. And so two, the two ladies that won uh, were Lauren Houston and Alicia Gonzalez, and they both just came into camp ready to go. <laughs> Amen. Lauren was a graduating senior, so she's gone now. She's already working in Faith Place. Amazing. And she just, man, she led her cabin so beautifully. She was kind of the mom figure the whole week. Right, Chloe? Okay. Mama Lauren. And, man, she, just the whole week she was just serving and loving on people. And one day she came up to me and was mad about some activity that we were doing that they were bad at. And about seven seconds later she was like, oh, yeah. It's not about me. Man, that's pretty cool. To see seven years in our youth group and see the kind of attitude and behavior that comes out of that. And then the other one was Alicia. I, d I don't know if I should have expected anything differently because this is just who she is. But she's one of the most servant-hearted people I know. All, all, all through camp, she, it, it, it didn't seem like she ever did anything for herself. She's just constantly serving, constantly serving, constantly serving. And... Let me tell you, it had an effect on her cabin. It had an effect on the people around her. And when, when we had Jen share about um, the effect that Alicia had, it was, it was overwhelming. So these two were the winners of our first annual Where Your Treasure Is Award because of their awesome hearts um, for serving. So praise the Lord. So those, those were some of the highlights, but... With those highlights, I, I've got to say, I, I can't, I'd be remiss to not thank you all. Because you guys as a church supported us, prayed for us, labored, endeavored with us, helped us plan. All of these things that made this possible. See, you guys, some of you guys had wristbands. And some of you got to hear a testimony about the person you were praying for that week. Unbelievable. And so thank you so much. You guys made such an impact. I, I, can't, I can't express adequately how much, it, how much confidence it gives us to go off to camp knowing that we have hundreds of people praying for us that, that God would work. That's unbelievable. And so thank you. But with that thank you, I still have one request. One more. And so let, let's get them up. Let's students or leaders, if you went to camp, go ahead and stand up. So my request, and some of, some, of the, some of the students were in first service, my request from you all is that these students and leaders learned all week about how to stand fast. And they did a really good job. They're learning, they're growing, they're, they're serving each other. And so I've, I've told them this story before, but um, when I went to camp and got saved, I think going into my freshman year, I came home and was so excited to tell my brother about it who was picking me up from camp. I said, hey, I got saved at camp. And his response was, shut up, you were already saved. <laughs> so I, a little bit of a hit to the face, right? Well, some of you can kind of relate to what that feels like. You've come back, stuff's a little bit harder. You don't have Gabe singing to you every morning to get up and read your Bible. I know Uriah's been missing that. You guys... You guys don't have that, the, the, the accountability is just a little bit less. And some of you guys have already started group chats saying, hey, have you read today? And that's unbelievable. Thank you. But it's harder. It's getting a little harder. And it's getting a little bit harder. And guess what? When you go back to school, it's going to get a little bit harder. And so what we need from you, church, is we need you all to encourage us to stand fast as well. And you can do that by praying. You can do that by encouraging but most of all, it's going to be because you guys stand fast as well. See, we learned about it all week, so we should be ready to go. But you all have the experience. You all have the wisdom from the Lord. 
You guys have years of standing fast that we need. Some of us have only been standing fast for a few years now. And so we need your experience, your wisdom, your steadfastness to stand fast ourselves. Because we as young people, when, when we see, we, we're around people all the time that, that flake out. We have a best friend that's like, yeah, I'm done with you. We have a girlfriend that breaks up with us for no reason at all. And so we, we need you all to help support us. Go ahead and have a seat. And so you guys, when, we, when we're talking about this behavior shaping our actions, right, that's ideal. But unfortunately, sometimes we know, or sorry, I said that wrong, our doctrine affecting our, our actions, sometimes we know exactly what the right thing to do is, and we still don't do it. And so I promised you we'd read from Philippians, so um, we're finally going to get there. We've only read one verse so far. But Philippians 1.10, hopefully you're there, is a really cool verse. And Paul's just kind of taking this whole chapter one. We actually learn a lot about Paul in this chapter. Um, but he's encouraging the church of Philippi to stand fast. And he's doing so in, in a variety of ways, which is pretty cool. So verse 10 says, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So how long? How long do we have to be sincere and without offense? Yeah, a long time. It's not just for a week. It's not just for a month. And so I have the greatest servant team around. They're in the blue shirts, by the way, if you couldn't tell by the beards and stuff. But we have a really tough challenge. See, I, man, my servant team deals with me. They deal with all the curveballs I throw at them, and there's a lot. Can I get an amen? Okay, that was nice of you. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> and, man, their hearts for young people are pretty amazing. If you, don't, if you haven't got to get, gotten to know them yet, you should because they're, they're pretty um, unbelievable people. But they have a challenge that is going to last a lifetime. And that challenge is they have young people getting to know them. They share their struggles with them. They share their highs and lows. And we as, as a servant team, if we don't endure, if we're not sincere and without offense, then one day these young people are going to grow up and they're going to reach out to us. And if they find that we're not serving the Lord anymore, that's going to be a shot. All that time and effort that we poured into them, if they find that we're no longer serving, the likelihood of them giving up just went up. Because these people that have loved on them cast Jesus to the side. And so beyond that, you guys have that same challenge as well. If you decide to take, to take me up on my last request to stand fast with us, that means you're going to be getting involved in the lives of students. You're going to be loving on them. You're going to be telling them, hey, I'm just I'm happy to see you. And when you do that, you're putting accountability on your shoulders. But there's no other way. You can reject it. You can say, ah, maybe when I'm ready, maybe when I've, when I've stood fast a few more years, then maybe I'll, I'll try to engage a little bit. But if we decide to wait, that waiting time just gets longer and longer. We start pushing it off and we start pushing it off. And unfortunately, many of you guys know what I'm talking about from experience. Many of you guys have followed somebody, have been discipled by somebody, and that person, you can't really tell if they're following Jesus anymore. And that's rough. And so you as a believer had to make the decision, well, the guy that I was following, the gal that I was following is no longer following Jesus, should I? And so we all have to answer that question. And I'm challenging you to step up to the plate and stand fast with us because we need you. We have to. We can't do it by ourselves. We've tried. Didn't work out so well. So we need you as a church body to stand fast with us. So that's the negative side. But there's an encouraging side too. So if we keep reading in Philippians, Philippians 1.14 says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
See, what was it about Paul that was giving them boldness? It was his bonds. Of all the highlights in Paul's ministry career, it was his bonds that led to boldness in the Philippian church. It was the trials and the struggles that he went to that led to the Philippian church standing fast. The hard thing. See, most, some of you guys coached Mighty Mites yesterday. I think it was 130. It was a little bit hot. And if you, I had the five and six-year-olds. And so as, we're, as you're hitting, right, how many of your kids actually did it right every time? Probably not very many. See, I have Riley, she's only four, but since Kyler's playing baseball, she wants to too. Every single time she comes up to bat in our living room, the bat is pointed to the floor. So by the time she actually gets that bat around, the ball's bounced off the wall and already come back to me. And every single time I say, hey, point the bat towards the sky. And then, then she started doing that, but then I noticed she was just kind of trying to hit the ball with the bat. Not really swinging, but just like, I want to make contact. And so I told her, Riley, swing hard. Swing really hard. And you know what happened? The next pitch, she hit it across the room and almost knocked a a picture off the wall. (laughs) See, when you guys are coaching little kids in baseball, it's amazing when you give them a technique that they need to fix and that immediately leads to results. That's amazing. Because they're not going to forget that. Riley's going to remember that, man, if I swing fast, I'll hit the ball better. But if that success doesn't come right away, if you have to say it over and over and it's still not leading to her hitting the picture off the wall, that doesn't mean you give up. That's actually the most important time for you to continue and to continue to to sharing the doctrine that you know. Because when they don't see the results, when stuff's not working very well, when the people they're sharing the gospel with are not responding, when they're not getting anything from the word of God, when they feel like their prayers are hitting the ceiling and coming right back down, they need us more than ever to encourage them and tell them the stories of when we felt that way as well and how God led us through. See, that's why the, in the Old Testament, the Exodus was shared so much. Because it was an incredible story. God came through in a mighty way. And so they told that story over and over and over again because it was incredible and it was life-changing. And so we need that as well. You guys have incredible stories of how God's changed your life. And for others to stand fast, they need to hear that story that you have to tell. So the last verse, um, or no, not not the last verse, sorry. Verse 14. No, no, sorry, 25, sorry about that. And having this confidence... I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. So why was Paul abiding and continuing? It was for others. Yeah, he he loved the Lord as well. He was doing it for that reason as well. But here he tells us it was for the other people around him. And so that's what we need as a church. We have to stand fast. We have to abide and continue so that the others around us have a reason to, to stick with it too. Because, man, it, for some reason, why is God not enough for us to just keep following the Lord? We need other believers. He didn't ask us to do this alone. We need each other in order for us to stand fast. And so, young people, this is your challenge as well. One of the verses that you should probably memorize is 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So you guys have all been given an opportunity to declare the hope that you have inside of you. You can be an example even if you're only in junior high. You can be an example even if you're only in high school. God's given you that that opportunity. So use it. If you guys got to see the baptisms that just happened about an hour ago, two of the three baptisms that happened today, those students are here because another student invited them to church. And then they got saved and have now been baptized. All because somebody decided to open their mouth and declare the hope that they have inside of us. You guys aren't too young. Let no man despise thy youth. But be thou an example in the word. Emily, I thought I was a good kid. But being around you, when I, was, when I thought I was a good kid when I was younger. But being around you, 
I, th I think I've lowered my uh, my uh, expectations of myself a little bit because I was not I was not praying for my friends as a sophomore like you were. Unbelievable. Guys, you can do it. You can. You can be an example. Naz, that was incredible. You allowed God to use you, and now there's one more soul going to heaven because of your example. Unbelievable. And once again, church, adults, parents, we need you as well. We need the encouragement. Now, it's, I, I found it easy to do this, so maybe you will as well. It's easy with young people to just jump to correcting them, right? Because, hey, you did something wrong, I know the answer. Yeah, do this instead, right? And that's fine. There's times for that. But, man, many times they need an arm around their shoulder, and they just need to be loved on. They need to be encouraged. They need to know that you're on their side, that you want them to succeed, that you're not trying to change their behavior so that our church looks better, but that you're changing their behavior so that they get to know the God of the universe better. See, and you guys have been doing that. I, was, I told the story in first service. Steve Bryles came and spoke in our high school the other day. He jumped on the table four times. I, I think some of the high school class was legitimately scared. He jumped on the table four times in order to make his point that we need a firm foundation. And Maddox can't be here today because he's out of town with his family, but he has coined the term in this, in this church, the Council of Debbies. Okay, so if your name's Debbie, you probably understand that because there's like a hundred of you. <laughs> and so this Council of Debbies, Maddox, Maddox does some plays at Grain Valley High School. And so the Council of Debbies and some other people who weren't named Debbie decided to come out to his high school and support him during one of his plays. And I meet with that dude a lot and it meant the world to him. And to know, once again, to know that there's hundreds of people behind you, praying for you, rooting for you, loving on you. And Marty, the granddaughters that you're raising, that's because of how much love that you have for them and how much love that they see from you. So you guys are doing it. Thank you. Thank you for loving on these young people because they need it. They need as many good examples in their life as possible. So will you be another one? They don't need just one. They don't need just two. We need a whole church together to come say, hey, I'm going to stand fast next to you as you attempt to stand fast as well. There are young men and young women who need the wisdom and experience that you have from the Lord. Will you be the next one? Will you love on this one? And will you be watching for this one? Just pick one. Start there. And when you see them, go tell them you're happy to see them, that you love them. And as a result of that, they're going to be more likely to stand fast themselves and to hold to the commitment that they made to God at camp. So will you be that one? Will you choose to stand fast, despite how difficult it is, despite the bonds that you have in your life, will you decide, I'm going to stand fast? Let's pray. God, we love you, Lord. God, we just give you the glory and the honor because it's what you deserve. And there's no other way that, that, that we want um, to live, Father. We want to give you the honor and the glory and the praise for being so good to us. So thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us grace when we need it most. God, and thank you for reminding us that you're on our side. That you want what's best for us. That no matter what's going on in our life, that you'll be there. That, that, you're, gonna, that you're going to uh, put your arm around us and encourage us and love us. And be there to, to, to support us in, the, in, the, in our endeavor to stand fast and to give you our lives. So God, we love you. Lord, would you spur inside of us to be the men and women you've called us to be, to encourage both the younger and the older and those around us, Lord. We love you. We ask these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. Dwayne.